Eugene, you just about have to ask directions at the airport how to get home. You've been away so long. <laughs> no, yeah, uh, ten and a half weeks, I believe. Uh, all up for the year, but in this last trip, yeah, nearly five, five weeks, nearly. So, um, yeah, it's been a while. Well, a successful trip or a mixed bag, of, tr but mainly successful. Yeah, I mean, 50-50. Uh, so we had two guys win, two guys lost. Um, yeah, I mean, that's like, for me, it's uh, like, a, like I've kind of explained to people, it's half and half. Like, there's half to be happy about, half to be sad about. Um, you, of course, the losses don't take anything away from the wins. Like, those guys got their wins, they deserve their wins. But for a coach, or for a coaching team, um, we went there to collect all four wins. And so if we didn't get them, um, you know, we didn't succeed in what we were trying to do. So it's uh, mixed feelings. But uh, all in all, um, you know, it's, it's positive. Like, yeah, we lost and, and we grieve a little bit because we lost, but the exciting part about it is learning from those losses and moving on from those losses and seeing what we can, you know, garner out of those losses. So, yeah. With Shane, just like caught early, uh, uh, we say in the game, caught cold and didn't recover, basically. Didn't have a chance to recover? or Yeah, I mean, look, Shane's fight for me is a write-off. I don't even think of it as him getting caught and stuff. Yeah, he did get caught and all of that, but for me it's a write-off. Obviously there was a controversy with the weight, and that's my problem with that fight. Um, you know, like what fighting's about, what martial arts is about, is giving people this equal playing field working within the rule set, working within the rules, and then trying to see who's the better man. So if you come into the playing field and it's not equal, then how do you know that? Like, you don't know that. Now, you know, a lot of people are saying like, oh, I just saw a loser or saw a loser, and this is what happened, it's just because you lost. Well, yeah, 100%, it's because we lost. But it's primarily because we lost on something that wasn't an equal playing field. So we don't really know who's the better man. We don't really know who's the better man. It's not like the guy, you know, the guy chose to stop losing weight. He didn't make the weight. He missed it by a significant margin. It's not about the weight differential. That's like, you know, like you can work with that. It's about what that last kilo of weight takes out of you to lose. That's what it's about. And Shane lost that last kilo. And that last kilo was hard. It's hard for every fighter. That's what's one of the most difficult things about fighting. It's what that last kilo of water, extracting that last kilo of water out of your body, it's what that does to you and what that leaves you with. And Shane went through that. And it took, it, it took its toll out of Shane. But that's okay. Because the other guy's got to go through that as well. So and we're, we're all equal in that regard. But unfortunately, the guy didn't do that. The guy cheated. The guy chose not to do that. The guy made a choice not to do that. He, he, he didn't make the, the, the playing field equal. So Shane went through that, and that guy didn't. So like, that's why I just write that fight off. I like, whatever. Shane got caught early, but as far as I'm concerned, it, yeah, I, I don't care about that fight. I don't care for the opponent. And um, I've told Shane just, like, it is what it is move on, we'll deal with that internally. But yeah, I, I, that kind of stuff disgusts me, so. Mm. And then Kai, he had a great round number one, and then. Yeah, I mean, it was like, uh, it was uh, back and forth, um, uh, number one, but all in all, I felt like um, there was some stuff there that we planned for and that we just had to bring Kai back onto track and then we would have had a lot smoother round. But as it, you know, as it, what happened, we, we saw what happened. Um, man, you got to give all the credit in the world to, the, to the, um, Brandon Royal. Like, it was spectacular. He got dropped twice and then he went to uh, something that we've seen him do, to be honest, um, that, and something that's very hard to prepare for, especially in that situation. He went to one of his uh, moves, which was a spinning back fist, and like, yeah, Kai got over anxious and pushed the, and didn't see it coming, and then that turned the fight around for the other guy. And uh, yeah, you got to give all the credit in the world to that guy. And you just have to go back to the drawing board with Kai and figure out what went wrong with the fight and then just move on. Like, um, yeah, you can't take anything away from that guy's win. 
He made weight. He did everything. It was a field playing field. Those guys went back and forth. Spectacular fight. Fight of the night. They both got bonuses. Um, all the credit goes on to the, you know all the credit in the world goes to Brandon Royal and uh, his team. They did like the excellent best job you can do. And with Brad, you said before you went away, you know that the the. the UFC is doing them no favours. They chucking the hard fighters at them. <laughs> it certainly was. What were you thinking after round number one? Because that was real difficult. Yeah, I mean, the UFC, they're all hard fights. They're all the top guys. But there's, like, levels. Even in the UFC, like in any industry, there's levels. And they've given Brad, like, you know, they've given Brad, like, three tough guys that could potentially in one or two years be some of the best guys in the world, top 10, top 15. And um, yeah, again, like Brad went through some adversity in round one and lost round one. And like for us, round one is a key. You know, why round, why round one's the key? Because if you can put that in the bag, you kind of have those two lifelines. So you have two more rounds. You can like, maybe something will go wrong and you lose a round while you've still got that other round to make up for it. So you, you essentially, you only have to win one more round to win the fight. Whereas the opposite effect happens if you lose round one, then the pressure's on you because you know you have to win the next two rounds. So like, we always treat round one very seriously and we say that that's something that we need to put in the bag and it goes part and parcel with the success of the fight. If you look at most fights uh, that go the decision, the person that runs round one is more than, you know, is inevitably normally the person that wins the whole fight. We lost for one and we put, got, that puts us under tremendous pressure. But Brad, like the true world-class athlete he is, uh, dealt with that pressure and won those next two rounds. So i um, very happy. Um, D- did you have to change the plan at all after, after the first? <clears throat> just some minor adjustments. We didn't have to change our strategy and we didn't have to do anything. Brad just had to apply it a little better. He was trying to, but the guy did wonderfully. He did a perfectly timed takedown. Um, he did some stuff in the ground that um, <clears throat> we, weren't prepared, we weren't prepared for. There was some stuff there. I mean, a, a lot of what we did, the, a lot of what he did on the ground to shut Brad down with, um, I've just had like two weeks to mull over it and go over it with the trainers and the boys. And actually in today's class, we were dealing with a lot of what that guy was doing. Like we like to get onto these things straight away and, and, and why they're fresh and deal with them so that we won't run into them as a problem again. Um, but that guy did a great job and, and shut Brad down. Brad just had to apply the plan a little better. It was just a couple of minor slips up, slip ups, which is all it takes. And then we brought Brad back to you know round two and three, which was more of Brad applying our game plan to him rather than the other way around. So. It was just like, you know, that's, that's the great thing about watching a good chess match. It's whoever can impose their strategy on the other person that's probably going to come out. It was quite uh, funny after the fight, Brad said you had to sort of hold him back because he likes to get him into a stouse, doesn't he? He likes that 50-50 zone and, and you told him just that you can lose this fight if you, if you get carried away. And right at the end, uh, you know, I, I, you know, one of the benefit of being with these fighters for so long and, and, and having a good relationship with them and knowing them so well is you, you understand how they think and you can almost see, you can almost see how they think and manifest how they're thinking. You can almost like impose yourself on them. So I needed to change his mind. I could see what he wanted to do and I needed to pull him back because the only chance that guy had of winning was if like Brad got caught with a stray shoulder, et cetera. So it was just like, yeah, just like, you know, acting as a kind of a balance to that at the end and just, just playing it a little safe and taking that win and, um, you know, retiring back home safely. <laughs> well, you were back on track after his fight, and uh, Izzy, well, was there ever any doubt? Um, there's no doubt, but there's apprehension. Apprehension's a bit different to doubt. Like, doubt is like you, you, you don't think that the guy's capable of doing it. Whereas apprehension is like you're not sure how Israel's going to deal with things. You have an idea of how Israel's going to deal with a certain problem, or any fighter, how they're going to deal with a certain problem, and the apprehension is that it's unproven until you actually get in front of the person and like they're actually kind of locked horns. 
So um, I always say that, well, you know, with many fights in the first 30, 40 seconds, you can tell which way they're going to go. And that was a perfect example of that. In the first 30 or 40 seconds of that fight, um, everything that I had kind of thought it would play out like um, eventuated, and then I felt very comfortable very early, um, more so than uh, some of his other UFC fights. So, um, yeah, it wasn't um, so surprising in that respect. Uh, that fight uh, went the way that I thought it would go, <coughs> went the way that I potentially thought it could go, apart from the stoppage. I thought the stoppage would come a little bit later after, after Israel had broken the guy down a bit more. Um, you've said somewhere before that uh, Izzy's kicks, you know, because his legs aren't big and round, they're really cutting. Um, so when you get kicked by him, you really feel it. And that just yeah. changed <coughs> Costa's mind, did it? Yeah, I mean, anybody who's done a lot of fighting and experienced a lot of leg kicks, like a Muay Thai fighter, kickboxing fighter, they know that, like, some guys, they just have those shins that where the bone seems to protrude through like the you know the, through the muscles and the other bits of tissue and stuff the bone just seems to be really prominent um israel is one of those guys yeah like um some guys when they hit you with a leg kick um you're not feeling the bone like you're feeling the weight of the leg and it's like a it's just like blunt force boom some guys when they hit you with their shin it's like a knife like boom and I think that's a good description of Israel's leg kick. Like, he, he has pretty thin legs, but his, yeah, his, his shins are like, yeah, they're more like a knife, so they really cut into the muscle and do a lot of damage. And uh, I wouldn't like to be on the receiving end of that sort of um, leg kick. I would rather be on, I, I think I could, would probably be able to deal with the thudding type leg kick better than the sharp one that kind of cuts through the muscle. And that's what happened to this guy. Like those, those kicks just hurt. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you left here, it was something different. The, the camp, the whole thing was different, but it was a lot different in that you had to go to another country, stay there for two days and then fly. I don't know what the distances or the time travel is, but it's a lot of traveling in a, in a very short time leading up to a fight. I mean, we had to we had to stay there for five, four, four or five days. I think we had to go to Vegas before we flew to Abu Dhabi, and like getting there was like we had to go to San Francisco, then we had to go to LA, then we had to fly to Vegas, and then there, there was a lot of travel. But I think we're we we're we're getting to the stage, and these guys are getting to the stage now. Where like for the last. Uh, you know, uh, three, four, five years of their career, they've exclusively fought overseas. Um, you know, they, they, they don't fight at the ABA or down at the YMCA anymore. Like, there's no, for them, there's no such thing as a 40 minute trip to their fight. Those days are over, unless, of course, the UFC comes to Auckland and then you get that privilege back again. But um, every fight they've had has been overseas. So they know that that travel is part and parcel. And when what you do is you, um, you know, it's a real thing, like a, a veteran fighter gets used to international travel and fighting under those circumstances in that environment with the different, you know, change in time zone. That's something you learn and you become experienced at. And these guys are exactly that, like they know how to deal with that, more so than a fighter who's fought locally most of their career and then all of a sudden they have to fight internationally. They're just not used to it. Well, these guys are used to it. They have all these different strategies in play to help deal with the travel and stuff and all the inconveniences. So they're, you know, like they're, they're professional at it. You touched on something I wanted to ask you about because with the success that we're having, um, Next year, UFC back in New Zealand. Would you predict? Yeah, look, I think what the what what the the boys are doing is where, and they're only the tip of the iceberg. They're just showing the potential of the country. Um, they're growing the sport exponentially. I think people are becoming very aware of MMA, and and the snowball effect of that is massive. There'll be more people in the gyms. There'll be more young fighters, more talent encouraged to come to this sport as opposed to other sports. I think it's just it's just going to be a flow-on effect, and I think the UFC understand that, especially after the last 
event here it was spectacular. It was massive. It was one of the loudest crowds they reckon they've ever ever heard. I think it's inevitable now that we get a UFC show back here regularly with the guys that we've got and the way that the New Zealand public responded to that last UFC. I think we'll probably get one every year. Um, that'll be the aim, as as opposed to like every three or you know four or five years. So I'm hoping. I'm hoping. Um, can we just ask a f few questions about the other fighters? Alex Volkanovsky, uh, where he is and, and is anything before the end of the year? Yeah, I mean, Alex is like, he's, he, he, uh, it's highly doubtful that he'll fight before the end of the year, um, but he'll be looking to fight um, early next year. Ale Alex is always training. I, I know he's like, uh, he's just kind of gotten on, like, and all power to him. Like I know he's just enjoying the being, enjoying the fruits of his labor, but he's been training. I think now he's getting to the stage where he's going to like start to train. Uh, you know, start to start to ramp up a little bit. You know, and you know, in preparation for what's coming early next year. Because now's about the time where you want to like start to get in reasonable shape before you start a, a really good camp. So he's just about to start ramping up his training a little bit. Um, but yeah, I doubt anything will come this year for him, but he'll be looking at early next year. And, and again, like uh, the fight coming up this weekend is a Korean Zombie and Ortega, and that will essentially give him his opponent. So we'll know from the, whoever's victorious in that fight who, who he's you know, more than likely to fight. Another thing that was pleasing on the trip, Carlos Olberg got uh, uh, accepted into the contender. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, and and like um, I think we talked about it before. Um, we definitely got, we got word from the UFC, from the matchmakers, that we should have Bloods and Carlos over there, um, ready to go. Medicals done and everything. And if an opportunity pops up, um, they know that we're readily available. To be honest, we nearly got both those guys over the line. We came within one phone call of getting those guys um, accepted onto one of the fight nights. Um, the silver lining in that is that I would have had to stay, like the team would have had to stay another two weeks. So, but we would have gladly done that. We would have gladly sacrificed that if they got in. What ended up happening was um, uh, the opponents that they could have gone in and and fought because there because there was pullouts. They weren't comfortable with either Carlos or Bloods. They chose someone else, which is like fair enough. But yeah, we were right there, ready to go, really anxious, waiting by the phone. But unfortunately, yeah, for one or another reason, um, they weren't chosen as an opponent by the other camp. But that's fine. Um, we managed to get this opportunity for Carlos, um, which is like he's not in the UFC, but he's, there's one foot through the door. He just has to drag the other foot through and then we're in. So we're really excited for him. He's a guy that uh, he's super talented. He can do great things in that light heavyweight division. Um, yeah, I think everybody everybody here on this side of the world knows who, who Carlos Holbrook is. Hey, thanks very much for your time. Great to see you back here. And uh, the heaps of energy when I walked in the door today. Uh, cracking yeah. the whip again, were you? <laughs> yeah, and I'm just happy to be out of that hotel. So uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Tony. It's always good to do our catch up. It's becoming a bit of a thing now. Like everybody, you caught up with Israel and stuff. Everybody's got to catch up with Tony. Um, he always gets the exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> hey, cheers, mate. Yeah. Thanks for everything. Thanks, Tony.